Uh, this is week three of the, the American Gulag. I'm going to focus today a little bit on H Harriet Tubman, uh, one of the, she's a, a dashing lady this is, uh, one who was uh, a slave, became uh, an escaped slave, uh, became an abolitionist, and later becomes a suffragette and was also a guerrilla and was also and also led union troops behind confederate lines and this, is a this is a happening lady this is for the time and um, she's supposed to have been born in 1822 her gravestone says 1820 uh, at one point she said 1815 her army papers uh, say, have 1820, 1822, 1825. Uh, of course, you know, record keeping for slaves as far as when they were born, uh, it's throw a dart at the board. Uh, the, so she did die March 10, 1913. That's established. And it's more or less considered that she was 90 years old when she died. Uh, so when she, w she was, she comes out of Dorchester County, Maryland. Keep in mind, she was a slave in Maryland. Her mother and father, uh, ben, um, uh, ben Ross, and her mother, Harriet Ross, and she takes her mother's name later on, Harriet. Her mother had a, had a nickname, Rit. And the, the Rosses will have, including uh, Harriet, they will have nine children. And Harriet's real name was, uh, Harriet, Harriet Tubman's real name was Araminta Ross. And she had the nickname Minty. She's later going to have a nickname Moses. And the reason she's called Moses by many slaves is because of how many times she goes back behind, you know, down before the, below the Mason-Dixon line and brings slaves out through the Underground Railroad. And as she said, as a conductor on this railroad, I never lost a passenger. <laughs> so, uh, and many of the people she brought out were relatives. But time and time again, she, she made 13 trips back, into the, back into, the, into the world of slavery to get people out. Interesting story. But she is the middle of nine children. And back then, uh, slave families, uh, even at five or six, she has to watch her younger brothers and sisters at five or six years old. Her mother, they, they, were, they were owned by a family known as the Brodus family, B-R-O-D-E-S-S. -S. And the Brodus family had it bought these slaves. And so they, Mrs. Brodus will hold the slaves and then her son Edward will take over after she's gone. And the, her father, uh, Ben Ross, actually is an expert woodsman. So he's working on the plantation, chopping wood, clearing wood, uh, processing wood, so on and so forth. Her mother works in the house. So she's watching, actually watching her younger brothers and sisters. And then, then interestingly enough, she is taken and put into another person's house uh, on loan, let's say. And she's five or six, and she's watching a baby at five or six years old. And this lady, Miss Susan, has, has uh, Araminta Araminta Ross, or Minty Ross, watching her baby. And, and when the baby wakes up, uh, Miss Ross here, Araminta Ross, is held accountable. And at five or six years old, she's whipped. She's whipped. And this is regular. In fact, she, re she recalls at one point, Harriet Tubman recalls at one point where she was whipped five times before breakfast. And she said she, you know, being whipped, she would finally do this job and wear extra clothes so the whipping wouldn't hurt. And at one point, even at six or seven, 
she runs off. She hides for a month. Of course, she's recaptured, and she's put back into the situation. As she gets older, she's working in the fields. She's, she's, working, she's using a hoe. She's clearing brush. And one point, at one time, she was, she's, a, she's a young teen at this point, 13, 14 years old, and she has to go into town to pick up some supplies, and then she has to come back. And while she's in the general store, a slave owner walks in, and as, and as Harriet Tubman is walking out, this slave owner, his slave is trying to escape, and he asks Harriet to try to stop him. And, this, and, the, and the slave that's escaping is a man. How is, how is a 13-year-old kid going to stop a man here, a woman, with her arm full of stuff? And <laughs> Harriet Tubman says no. And so the guy picks up a two-pound piece of steel and chucks it. He was going to hit the slave or the man. And he hits Harriet Tubman in the head, almost kills her. <coughs> and... Harriet is taken back to the Brodus, Brodus plantation and she's laid down for two days. She rests and even with her hair, even with her head, she had a cracked skull. She's back in the fields. And she thinks the re she says later on the reason she survived is because of her, she had a lot of hair, but it was never brushed or combed. So how do you think it looked? You know, it looked like a tumbleweed. And she thinks that's why she survived. The hair cushioned the blow of the steel hitting her in the head. But for quite a while, she would have this urge to just stop and go to sleep because of being hit in the head with this piece of steel. Then she stated she was getting visions. And she's becoming more and more, acquaint uh, more, and more acclimated to and have an affinity for Christianity. Of course, her mother used to read Bible stories to her. And Harriet Tubman actually moved toward the Old Testament instead of the New. And the reason being, the story of Exodus intrigued her. And she didn't like the New Testament because it wasn't, we'll use the term, revolutionary enough as opposed to the Jews, Jewish people escaping bondage, those stories began to appeal to her because of what's gonna, she's, what she's going to do later on. Another thing that really, uh, really um, uh, influenced her, this is a time here, you know, she's born, well, she's born like 1820 or 22, 1815, whatever the case may be, no one can know exactly. But by the time you get into the 1840s, uh, you know, she's, she's, she's really getting older here. Uh, three, of her, three of her brothers and sisters have already been sold, in the slave, uh, sold, sold to other slave owners because of that expansion into the South and Southwest. She's already lost three of her brothers and sisters. And her mother, her youngest brother, his name is Moses, and her youngest brother is going to be taken, and this is where her mother really steps up to the plate. And she tells the prospective buyer, if you try to take my son, I'm going to crack your skull. Well, the sale doesn't go through. And so at this point, you know, the, the ideas of trying to escape are really strengthened at this point because she does not want to be sold. And there were a couple of times where she could have been sold, but because she got hit in the head with that slab of steel and she had this urge to go to sleep or, you know, just to rest, she's not saleable. She's not a saleable commodity. That kind of helps her to a certain extent here. And by 1842, 1845, uh, again, when you can be exact, she actually meets a man by the name of John Tubman. This is in Maryland. He's a free black. He's a free black. However, she's still considered a slave. And at this point, if she marries him and they have children, those children will have to be slave. That's the law. 
And so they get married. Interestingly enough, uh, she's going to try to escape. This is 1848-1849. And with two of her brothers, they escape. However, her brothers change their mind. And they go back to the plantation. And she, by the way, does not want to stay on the plantation. So she escapes again. And this time, she's successful because she went alone. Now, it's hard to trace her exact route. I have maps, I have maps here, and the last map is the Underground Railroad. Her route was pro probably, this is what they say, this is what the research states, probably. From Maryland to Delaware into Pennsylvania. Now keep in mind, you're getting into, the, you're getting into eight, 1849, 1850. And in Philadelphia, there had been a number of free blacks and escaped slaves. Some of them on their way further north. Some are going into New York. Some are trying to get to Canada because the British had outlawed slavery. But at the same time here, this, this black population of the free blacks in Philadelphia, you have an influx here of Irish immigrants coming in. And where do you think, and this is interesting, competition for low paying jobs, who do you think will get the first dibs on those jobs? Even though the Irish are immigrants, aren't they white? Mm-hmm. And so some of these blacks continue to move north. Now, Harriet Tubman does odd jobs to make money. At the same time, she's getting it through in her head that she wants to go back and rescue members of her family and the extended family. And so she begins to make these forays back into Maryland. And she begins to pull people out, one, two at a time, sometimes even five or six. And she becomes pretty good at this. And she even times when she's going to go. She does this a lot in the winter. You know, when people want to stay indoors and be warm. Less chance of being caught. And she, she begins to know, uh, know the route here along the Underground Railway. And she does rescue members of her family. And at this point, she begins to become acquainted with firearms here. <laughs> In fact, it was stated on one of the trips north. Uh, one of the men she was rescuing began to get cold feet, and he wanted to go back. And she told him, you can try to go back if you want, but you'll never make it. She would have shot him. Come to find out, that man will stick and make it to Canada and become free. She later on is able to buy property in Auburn, New York. Now, this part of New York, uh, west, western part of New York, is actually a hotbed of abolitionists. And she actually buys the land from, from, uh, sec from was gonna Senator Stanton, who she buy that buys land for $1,200, who sells the land to her for $1,200. And so this becomes the family state if you want to call it that and some of her family will live here yet in 1850 when the fugitive slave act is passed you know th this is this is you know this this is pretty sorted here you're escaping to the north because you want to be free if you're black and yet it makes no difference where you are in the country uh, you know Congress passes this this act that you cannot repeat cannot uh, protect slaves. They have to be turned over to their former owners. And so now, now, the, now the quest is on to get out of the United States altogether and get into Canada. Because there, there you're assured of being free. But in er certain areas of the country though, they ignore, almost like the sanctuary cities issue today, where certain cities, well, the hell what the federal government says. You know, this is a sanctuary city. You're seeing the same thing develop here. Also at this point, also at this point, as you get into the 1850s, the abolitionist movement 
is gathering momentum. She becomes pretty good friends here with Frederick Douglass. In fact, on one of her forays, she stays at Fed, with, with, Frederick, with Frederick Douglass while moving blacks further north. And he gets to know her pretty good. Another person she is going to get to know is John Brown. John Brown, who John Brown, by the way, knew about Harriet Tubman before, before he met her. He used to call her General Tubman. Interesting, the story here. At one point, she wants to go back down into slave land and get her husband out, although he's a free black. Come to find out, when, he, when she goes back, this is the early 1850s, when she goes back, uh, they haven't seen each other in a while. Guess what happened here? He married someone else. He doesn't want to leave. She decided at one point she was going to make a big scene here. Then she changes her mind. She runs into several blacks who are looking to escape, and she forgets her husband and then rescues them and brings them north. And interestingly enough, she's really not that, you know, even, ha even after having escaped, many of these slave owners don't know that it is her rescuing slaves seeking to escape. You know what she used to do when she used to sneak back into, in, 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 into Maryland to rescue slaves? She would sometimes get a couple of chickens and hold on to the chickens. And the reason she did that, it looked like she was a slave carrying chickens for a slave owner. It was also, she was on a train one time going into Maryland. And as she's sitting on the train, she noticed a slave owner that knew, that at one point knew her. And it was well known back then that she was illiterate. She couldn't read, so she picked up a newspaper and stuck her face in the newspaper, and the, and the, slave, owner, and the slave owner went right on by. Went right on by. So she got to know these little quirks and develop these, 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 these little tactics here that, that really ensured her survival. At the same time, when the Civil War finally starts in 1861, uh, you know, there was really no movement afoot here with the federal government to free the slaves. No, Lincoln wasn't interested in that. He was, Lincoln, he was interested in putting the country back together. And she, she chastised Lincoln for this. She chastised him for this. And, but in 1863, when the Emancipation Proclamation comes out, uh, by this time, she's actually volunteering her time to help the Union Army. She's cooking for the soldiers, helping with the wounded, and then she begins to lead forays behind Confederate lines. And she's particularly adept at doing this in South Carolina, and later she'll do this in Florida. But she's adept in South Carolina because there are certain areas on the coast of South Carolina that are considered almost like, North Car uh, almost like uh, uh, Maryland. You know, her use of the terrain, her use of cover, her ability to sneak in and sneak out is highly valued. Is highly valued. In fact, in 1863 at the Combahee River near, near Jacksonville, North, near Jacksonville, Florida, she leads, she leads, she leads federal troops behind Confederate lines and they rescue 700 slaves on steamers and take them out. Interesting story here. And she leads this effort as a, if you want to use the term, a guerrilla. There were slaves, there were slaves who couldn't wait to get on those federal steamers and then get back to Savannah where the, at one point the, 
the, the, the feds had a, the, the federals had a, had a base. People coming down with their kids. They said there were even people coming down with a, with a pot, with a, with, with a cooked chicken to get on board these ships and get out. 700 of them in 1863. Interesting here, interesting here how this lady st real, really is, be her, her, the aura about this lady is really, be is really growing here. And this lady's only like five foot, she's, she's shorter than Peter Laurie. Only instead of Peter Lorre as Mr. Moto doing things like this in a movie, this is real life. Yes. I'm going to get more into that Dred Scott decision next week when I do an overview of this. Um, that's going to come next week. Yeah. Uh, she learns to learn to read a little bit. Yeah. Her father, her mother, read to her, read the Bible to her. Right. But her mother used to, well, that's what, that's what, that's what really inflamed this lady, the, the Bible stories, especially Exodus, you know, the Jewish people escaping bondage. That really appealed to her. It really did. And that helped set the stage for this lady. Well, it, right, yeah, it was, yeah, you really couldn't teach slaves to read. You weren't supposed to. You weren't supposed to. Um, you know, uh, you don't want an educated slave. That's not what you want. Right. But at this point, though, you know, <coughs> while, while she's, while she's uh, doing all these marvelous things, <coughs> you know, it was known that she could not read, which is why on that train she picked up a paper, stuck her face in the paper, so, well, this person knows how to read, or this or this black lady knows how to read, so she must be a free black. And so, but anyway, you know, at this point, going in 1864, 65, as the war is winding down, uh, you know, but she's not only rescuing people, but again, she is helping wounded, wounded Union soldiers. She is also cooking for them. She's also cleaning some of them if they can't clean themselves, if they've been wounded. Uh, this, this lady is doing everything here. This lady is doing everything. When the war is over, interesting what happened. And she's well known at this point. And keep in mind, she's really not getting paid for this. And there's no, and there's no movement afoot for a pension for this lady at this point. Yes. She did work odd jobs, and she did make some money on the side. Um, and so that she was able to do. The problem here is after this, after buying the property, and after helping her family, and many times footing this, footing this out of her own pocket, she's not really very, she's not rich. In fact, many times she was, she was poor, but she was able to hold on to the property. Um, and that's going to that's be an issue as the story goes on here. And so when the war is over with, she's on a train going back to uh, Auburn, New York. And she's sitting in the car. Now this train's going up through, going, going up through Delaware, going up to New York. And the conductor says she has to go, she has to go sit in the, in the in, you know, she's in the, she's in the, she's in the car, she's in the passenger car. She has to go sit in the cargo car. And she says, well, I don't have to do that. And she explains what she did in the war. That didn't make any difference to the conductor. And he goes to take her out of the seat, and she resists. He asks for help from two other guys. And they, pull, they forcefully take her out of that seat, and she, they break her arm doing it. And then they take her to the cargo car, throw her in, broken arm and all. And there were actually people in the car saying, throw her off the train. Throw her off the train after what this lady does in the war. Interesting story that is. And come to find out, a newspaper journalist got a hold of that story. And he publishes it. And there were many people, many of them white, who thought this was terrible. This was terrible. But it doesn't help her at, at, at this point. But she does become 
a suffragette. The war is over. There's no more, there's no more reason to be an abolitionist. She does become a suffragette. And in the course of, and she's asked, you really think women have a right to vote? She says, what do you think gives the women a right to vote? And she explained what she did in the war. Women don't have a right to vote? That's how she answers this. And she becomes friends with, as, as this goes on, with Susan B. Anthony, who, you know, at this point is an ardent suffragette. Who, uh, who and herself had been an abolitionist. Now keep in mind the, uh, the, the suffragette movement at this point, going back to the 1850s, 1860s, they needed the abolitionists because people like Susan B. Anthony were, you know, when they were trying to get, their, trying to get the suffragette movement in print, in newspapers, couldn't get it done. So they, so they actually joined up with the abolitionists and abolitionist newspapers would put articles on the suffragette movement in the abolitionist papers. And that's how this became public. Interesting how two movements came together here. And so Harriet Tubman joins the suffragette movement. But, you know, when you get into the 1870s, 1880s, uh, this, the, the, the stories of this lady become more and more public, and she's becoming more and more acceptable to the public in general. She's even giving talks on this, on what she did, and the suffragette movement. However, as, as, as time goes on, that injury to her head, she needs, she needs surgery. And in the 1890s, she will have surgery done without anesthesia. She even stated that they, that they cut part of her skull. And the story goes that she did not, she did not have anesthesia and she bit down on a bullet during the operation. And why did she bite down on a bullet? because she saw that numerous times helping so northern soldiers when they were being operated on during the war. The operation did help to a certain extent and help, probably helped prolong her life. Um, and by the turn of the century, uh, she's not in the best of health. She's not speaking as much anymore and she finally winds up in a home for women where she will die on March 10, 1913. And as she's dying, uh, she states, <laughs> she states to the, some of her family and friends who were with her when she died, she's just like, she made reference to the fact of some of the people she helped to rescue from slavery. And she said, she told the people who were wa at, at her deathbed, she said, I am now on my way, I'm a going forward to reserve a place for you. And in 1913, March 10, 19, that day we know, March 10, 1913, it's the day she was born that no one can really say for sure. But they think she was 90 years old when she died. 90 years old. Now this is a lady here too, who is who is one of those, uh, and had a tough time doing it, is raising the stature of women in the 19th century going into the 20th. Like a Susan B. Anthony, like Helen Keller. Now, Helen Keller comes out of the 19th century, although she's born later on. She's, bo she's born later on uh, in 1880. But the fact of the matter is, she's one of those ladies, too. And people who, ladies who will come along later on, like Margaret Sanger, you know, Eleanor Roosevelt, Amelia Earhart. But Harriet Tubman is one of the early real, interesting here too, interesting here too. She was looked upon as one of the top three people, top three Americans of the 19th century by some people. 
That's, a, that's saying a lot. In fact, what was it Mark Twain once said about Helen Keller? He said, <laughs> he said the, two, the two greatest people to come out of the, to, 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 really make a, to really make their presence known in the 19th century were Napoleon and Helen Keller. And that was Mark Twain who said that. Included in this handout for Helen of uh, Harriet Tubman, I said I was going to bring some maps. That first map, by the way, because I alluded to this in the first talk, the slave trade itself, the map route, the triangular fashion of the trade, slave trade, bringing slaves from Africa to the West Indies and then to North America. And then the trade route carrying goods back. Some going to Europe, some even, you know, trade even going to uh, Africa itself and or, or, or back to the Caribbean and then back to Africa for more slaves. The second map, by the way, is the Missouri Compromise, which I alluded to in that first talk as well. The problem of admitting new states into the nation, especially when it came here looking at Congress. You know, each state has two senators. So you want to make sure, if you want to make sure you keep track of the count, both North and South were doing this. Both North and South were doing this. Keep in mind, like I said, in the, what you stated in the Constitution as well, you know, even, even, though, even though slaves, blacks were considered property, didn't Southern politicians were able to get a three-fifths compromise here that for, that, that, for, that for representation purposes, slaves were worth three-fifths of a people, or three-fifths of a person, each slave. Boy, talk about having your cake and eating it too at the expense of your fellow man. The Land Division, the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854, this kind of shows you where the country's going in 1854, because only six, se seven years down the road, well, six years down the road is when they begin to the states begin to secede. And so you can see here that dark, that dark and gray area here. This is really the Confederacy, what you're going to see. And so this does give you an idea here, the advantage enjoyed by the North here eventually. I mean, look where all the resources really are in those areas eventually controlled by the North. And so when you look at, look at this map, most of the population, most of the industry, most of the resources, and you know who controls the banking system, how is the South going to win this war and preserve Southernism and preserve slavery? They're not. They're not. But keep in mind one thing. When you talk about this thing known as slavery, slavery existed a lot longer under the stars and stripes than it did under the stars and bars. You know, all this noise about, get, about, about the stars, about the, star, about the Confederate battle flag on some of these buildings down south. I mean, keep in mind here, slavery existed a lot longer under the stars and stripes than it did under the stars and bars. I'm not condoning flying the stars and bars. That's not the point. The point here is looking at it from a historical perspective, from a perspective, from a perspective of reality here. Interesting here. Interesting. And then the last one here, the Underground Railroad. You know, the Underground Railroad, to a certain extent, is like the Ho Chi Minh Trail. You hear Ho Chi Minh Trail, it sounds like one trail. Well, no, it's not. It's splintered. One trail would have been easy to close it. Not so when there's, a, when there's various arteries here for moving people and supplies. It's the same thing here. Even this map won't capture all the little trails that come out of this Underground Railroad. 
and all the people involved, you know, at each station, each safe house, if you want to use that term. You can probably find places up here, maybe even in Darien, where the slaves were smuggled through on their way north. On their way. They're supposed to, there was supposed to have been an area in Norwalk, down near Wall Street, an underground cellar or, or cavern underneath, underneath the city where they used to hide blacks on their way north. I've never seen it but it's supposedly, it, uh, to some, it does exist. Interesting here. And so as, you know, again, going back to that 1850 Slave Act, which was Fugitive Slave Act, even though you couldn't, you couldn't protect slaves who were escaping, you were supposed to turn them over to the original slave owner, you still had some people who didn't believe that. Many people, apparently, here, it takes a lot of people to staff this. And so when you have somebody like Harriet Tubman smuggling people north, stopping off at these various substations, well, you have to have a certain amount of people to become a, to become a state. At one point with the Northwest Ordinance, it was 60,000 people. 60,000 people. Yeah. And so uh, now... You having asked that question, I'm going to double check if see if that was revised as you get into this, uh, this part of the 19th century. Because there are a lot of people moving west. And again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in, in an earlier series, uh, you know, I mean, th th this, is, this, this, is, this is that period in American history where you are really seeing the individual. You know, you're really manifest destiny, grabbing that land if you want to better yourself, if, if you're somebody who can't make it in one of the few cities we have, or a town, or a village, whatever the case may be, economically I'm talking, and you want to better yourself and your family, what do you do? Well, you go 50, 100 miles west and grab land. 10 acres, 20 acres, 50, whatever it is. And make a go of it. Which is why even, which is why even at this point in American history, socialism isn't going to resonate. What do I need socialism for? I can grab land and make it on my own. I don't need that. I don't need socialism. Uh, that's at this point. And so peep, there's that race to move west. Of course, you know who's going to lose here? The Indian. The Indian. We're taking his land, let's be honest. And so, but that, ra but that race, especially Kansas, I guess, is a poster child expression here. You've got slavers moving in as opposed to free staters. And this brings in people like who? John Brown. I mean, you know, John Brown can, can at one point considered this the make, make or break or really this place to really stand the ground against slavery. Bringing the religious end into this. God has called me to, you know. And so uh, it becomes known as Bloody Kansas. In fact, um, two of... Uh, Susan B. Anthony's brothers go to Kansas. One becomes a newspaper editor. One of her brothers joins John Brown's group. Susan B. Anthony. She was, as I said, she was an abolitionist too. Well, part of this is uh, to start to start with. Part of this is when 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 you look at where the where you know looking at this map, and you see Minnesota Territory, Nebraska Territory, Oregon. I mean, those areas aren't going to be conducive to slavery. You're not growing cotton up here. It's just not going to happen. And so even though the South would have liked to maybe have those territories, how is it going to work for them? It's not. They have a slave economy. So it's a no-brainer that these territories are going to come in as the North. In fact, New Mexico, you're going to grow cotton in the desert? No, you're not. So where is that state eventually going to go? North. It's going to be a northern state. And so, interestingly enough, you know, they're, they're actually, the South is actually going to be reined in by what's conducive to the products they're growing here. Right, climate. Um, but at the same time here, like the Nebraska Territory, that's a big slice of territory. Now, why isn't that just one state, Nebraska? It depends on, 
on really the, how the territory is arranged by the people who are there. And so you might see part of this territory become a state while the rest remains a territory. You know, and of course, not, you, you, of course, some of these people, not everyone's going to want to be a state at this point anyway. It depends what's going, it depends, it depends on the people involved and how organized they are and how many people there are there. And so, you know, this, in fact, when does New Mexico and Arizona become a state? Yeah, not until the 20th century. Early, Arizona became a state when? 19, 19, 1919, right. Yeah, it's one of the last. Well, if you don't count Alaska and, and Hawaii, right. I mean, Hawaii became a state 1960. 59, 59, 60, yeah. That's late. But that's understandable. She's 2,000 miles off the shore. Yes. Yeah, we're really growing corn and things like this. I mean, you can go up the line now and find that. But cotton needed 200 frostless days. And so as, the, as the, what's going to be the Confederacy is expanding even further south, I'm going, like to, uh, the, going into places like Alabama, uh, Louis, Mississippi, Louisiana, uh, cotton is going to be, it's going to be easier to, and, and Texas, it's going to be easier to grow it there. And there's going to be less reliance on North Carolina. North Carolina is going to lose a lot of the cotton trade. And so places like Georgia, uh, Mississippi, Alabama, later Arkansas, the, these are the states where you're really going to see, and, that, and since cotton is moving that way, you need slaves to staff those plantations. And so some of these slave owners who have slaves, they're going to sell them, lease them, rent them, whatever the case may be. And at the same time, they're going to pull children away from some slave families and sell them off. I mean, it's human trafficking. That's what this is. It's human trafficking. I don't hear that term used to describe this, but that's what this is. It's a form of human trafficking. And especially when you, you know, there, is, there are more slaves, and of course, as the product, you're opening up the product here, more territory to grow this product, and, you know, I mean, we are becoming the Saudi Arabia of cotton. And so, does that force the price of the slave up? Yeah. I mean, going back to what I said last week, I mean, at one point during the war, you can buy one for $1,800. 25, 30 years later, you could have bought that slave for 500 bucks. No, with the demands of war too. Because keep in mind, as the war goes on, and the reality of, of industrialized war becomes prevalent here for even the South, now you're going to be using slaves less for uh, processing cotton and more for maybe growing food, taking these slaves and fixing the roads, having slaves working in armaments factories. That's what happened in Selma, Alabama. They had a lot of blacks working in munitions factories, powder, so on and so forth. The economy has to change. You're still not paying these people. They're still unpaid toilers. But now you're taking them off the land and now putting them into factories because you need them for the war effort or fixing the railroads this kind of thing. Or even loading and unloading ships, which they were using them for anyway, but now it's a war effort. And so what you're seeing the South do here is something the Nazis are going to have to do later on down the road with, it, with East Europeans and so on and so forth. Slavs, gypsies, so on and so forth. So. Well, again, again, going back to the map you just brought up, the Missouri Compromise, take a look at this Missouri Compromise line, 36, 36 degrees, 30 minutes. That whole territory there would not be admitted as slave. And, so the, and, and, then, and then look at the Oregon country or Oregon territory. At one point, that was jointly occupied by the United States and Britain at one point. And the reason it's occupied jointly you know, after the War of 1812, 1815, uh, the, the Oregon Territory in the 1817, 1818 was jointly occupied uh, because the British 
the British knew Americans were going to go west. And they understood that the United States would like nothing better than to grab hold of Canada. Well, what difference does it make if they want to try to grab hold of Canada through the Great Lakes, or when they eventually go west, they want to try to grab hold of Canada from the other opposite end of the continent here. So let's jointly occupy it. You know, the United uh, Britain still keeps a foothold in North America here in the United States. What we're going to be, what's going to be in the United States? But at the same time, maybe they can prevent the United States from occupying Canada. And at the same time, the British, again, knowing how to read a map, if we jointly occupy this with the United States, the Russians won't grab it. Coming out of Alaska, that's how they see this. Why the British were the world's great, greatest colonial power. They knew how to read a map. You know that thing we don't do too well with anymore? Geography. So uh, there's, there, there is that going on as well. There is that going on as well. And then if you look just to the right of the Oregon Territory, which some of that is that Nebraska Territory, closed to slavery by the Missouri Compromise. So what do the Southerners see? they see that they're being ringed in. So what are we going to do? Let's secede. Because if they're going to stop us from having slavery in many of these new territories, it's only a matter of time before they're going to try to stop slavery in South Carolina, Florida, Georgia, so on and so forth. So let's get out. Only in the end it won't work. So, right. Well, you know, that... that California, I mean, there were some Southerners who would have liked to have had California, but are they really going to grow their products there? That's the thing. But then again, if you want to preserve that, the math, the math in Congress, would you have wanted that anyway? I suppose. I suppose. But it's really not conducive to them economically. And so California will be considered, again, look at that Missouri Compromise line. It won't be coming in as a slave state. And so they're not going to get the Oregon Territory either. I mean, these are huge swaths of territory that the North is eventually going to control. And it's, more, and it's more than just the Civil War here. I mean, look at this coast, California, Oregon Territory, and so again, looking at the British, they understand one thing here. If the, if the Americans are going to develop the East Coast, it's only a matter of time before they develop the West Coast, and then if you take a look at, uh, at Central America, gee whiz, how do they cut the sailing time by going all the way around South America? You build a canal. Uh, we don't want them doing that. So there's more than slavery going on here at the same time here. You know, there's the overall strategic aspect of this by the big powers. But at the same time, some of these big powers, like the British and the French, where are they getting their cotton from? The country that's expanding. The United States. So, interesting here. Interesting here. You know, geography does tell the tale here as it usually does. It's like stamp collecting. You get a stamp from a certain country, gee, what kind of language, how many languages does this country speak? What kind of products do they export? You know, how are their politics? And it, it breeds questions. That's what I always found with stamp collecting. Yeah, yeah, you know, when, 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 you, when, you look at, when you look at this, I, I kind of equate the southern aristocrat with the Russian boyer, the land of gentry. You know, the, 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 you go back to Tsarist Russia at this, at this time, the you know, British and the French, the Industrial Revolution, even that's even happening here. Uh, it's the, you're seeing society modernize. People, some people are moving off the land to work in these factories. Is that happening in Russia? Really not till the end of the 19th century. The landed gentry, though, over there, the boyer, doesn't want to lose his privileged position. Yeah, that's how the Romanovs really stay in power. They cater to the landed gentry. No, and, and, and at the same time here, you know, as countries like Britain and France and the German states, 
you know, as Germany develops into a country, what does Bismarck do? Yeah, we want industrialization. We want to be the, we want to be the political and economic heartland of, of Central Europe. That's what he wants. To, that's what he wants. That takes industrialization and finance. Russia is behind the times. Well, take a look at the Southerners. You know, yeah, you're seeing too much land and too few hands. And at the same time here, since they control, since they control the economy, who are most of the governors in the South? Uh, you know, that, that I put I had in that handout last week. Slave owners who staffed many of the seats in these southern parliaments in these southern states. Slave owners. So who controls the economy? The slave owners. So they're going to control the politics. Not too much different than what was going on, in a way, the Tsarist Russia. It's not the same political system, I'll give you that, but it's the landed gentry that controls the politics, which goes back to, you know, when Lenin, in 192, when he wrote that book, What is to be Done, which is an important book in the evolution of communism, to me, after the Communist Manifesto, he's taking, he's taking something, a uh, revolution of the proletariat. Well, how many people in Russia are proletarian? 10%? 90% are peasant. So what he does is he takes, he takes a revolution based on the factory worker and he states, well, we're going to have a proletarian revolution, but we made ourselves up with the peasant. Okay, that'll work. That's what he does. And so there's this evolution here, but he understands this. But at this point, the end of the 19th into the 20th century, Russia was really beginning to industrialize. Of course, they still can't compete with the British, the French, and the Germans, or the United States. They can't. Stalin will do that. But does this take away the power of the landed gentry eventually? Yeah, it does. It does. It does. Just like the Civil War will do that here. Because who's going to win this? Again, goes back to what I mentioned earlier. You know, it's nice to talk about slavery, so on and so forth. I'll give you that. But to me, the real, the building block here goes back to when the country is formed. That Hamiltonian agenda of the, land, of the, of the agrarian versus the Hamiltonian agenda of industrialization slash finance. I mean, Hamilton wasn't stupid. You can see the, if you really have your eyes open, you can see the Industrial Revolution snowballing here. And he understands that this is what's coming. And I think Jefferson really did too. That's like today. We don't have the Industrial Revolution. Now it's, and it's been this way, the Technology Revolution. Things changed. Things changed. Who wants to work in a coal mine anymore? They took over some of the armories that the North had down there. Or that were the United States of America armories. They took over those armories. But still, um, unless you have the steel and the, well, you have the wood, you know, the steel to process the steel, uh, how are you going to make gum barrels, things like that? Right, right. Because, you know, when you look in 1860, uh, the, South, uh, the South had, the South processed, I think, 75,000 tons of steel in 1860. The North? Try 2,500,000 tons. Well, who's going to win this? It's like comparing the Soviet Union with Nazi Germany you know, it, it, in World War II. Uh, yeah, it's going to be the North. Um, will the South improve their ability to process steel? Sure they will. They're late in the game. They're going to be late in the game because once the North gets untracked, and gets onto a wartime economy, uh, what you see here is a mirror image of what's going to happen in 1914. And again, I, and I'm going I'm to make that jump next week. You know, what happens to the southern aristocracy here by 1865? Kind of a mirror image of what's going to happen to the Habsburgs, the Hohenzollerns, the Romanoffs in 1918-19.
And so this, I, and, and, and again, getting back to when, which makes Ulysses S. Grant, one of our greatest generals, is not what he does in the field as opposed to how people like he and Sherman see what's going on overall here. This is an industrialized war at this point. Who can win this? We are. It's almost like the North can't, the South can't win it. The North has to lose it. And they're not. They're not. So, yeah, you know, society's changing. Society, economy, uh, politics, culture, it's all changing at this point. Coming out of the age of reason, enlightenment, industrial revolution, technology, capitalism, no, it's changing everything. It's killing, it's killing mo uh, monarchy. It's killing, uh, you know, serfdom. It's killing landed gentry. Only there are people who want to try to preserve that. And going back to your question, Keith, the, some, of these southern some of these southern aristocrats want to preserve. Eh, you can't blame them. They have the privileged position. Why not want to try to save it? Not going to work. Not going to work. So, and yes, urbanization, industrial. This, this begins to set that pace for urbanization and industrialization of the South. Because look, and I'm sure some of you folks remember, and you can, all you have to do is just drive up Route 7 or drive up Central Connect, go up, go up to Derby, go up to Ansonia. What do you see there? Abandoned. Old factories, right? Massachusetts. Somebody said Massachusetts. Yeah. 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 Because uh, clothing factories, uh, the hat factories, where'd they go? Eventually go went south, right? Because the labor was cheaper. And so the seeds for that are set. 1865, 1868. So again, things happen over a long period of time here. They don't happen overnight. They do not happen overnight. But I mean, this is what you're, you know, and, and again, and again, especially now, well, by now I mean the, the going from the 18th through the 19th into the 20th century, again, one of the biggest locomotives of change, in fact, arguably it is, war. It changes everything. Everything. So. So it helps destroy, destroy the Confederacy. Yeah, one, well, at one point, Russia was in the Pacific Northwest at one point. And that's why the British were occupying the Oregon. You know, the, the, being the consummate colonial power, they don't want the Russians coming back down here. And so if they can enlist American help, you yeah, know, why not? But that doesn't mean the British are going to give up Canada either. Because Canada eventually becomes part of what? A commonwealth. And so, but again, you're even seeing here the beginning of the slippage of the British Empire here is what you're seeing with the growth of the United States. You're beginning to see this here. It's a long process, but you're seeing it here. But again, at, keep in mind, at this time, even in 1820, the British are moving into the Middle East to preserve their Indian Empire. They're moving in here. They're doing this right now. Right now. And they don't want the Spanish, they don't want the French coming back here. They don't want the Russians coming back here. Because if the French, if the Spanish or the French or the Russians try to come back here to expand their colonial holdings, that means the British are going to have to expend resources to keep them out. And they don't want to do that. India is still the crown jewel of the British Empire at this point. Yes? Elizabeth Cady Stanton? Yeah, well, they were a one-two punch anyway. Um, yeah, you know, th this, of course, when, when Harriet Tubman is discussed, she's, I guess, I don't know if it's because it's not, it hasn't been covered well enough or they don't equate her this way. Everyone thinks of her, for the most part, as an abolitionist, escaped slave, so on and so forth, not part of the suffragette movement. Yet she does be, oh, after 1865, what do you need abolitionists for? And so she finds another line of interest 
and that was the suffragette movement. But again, she's not equated with that movement like an Elizabeth Cady Stanton or a Susan B. Anthony. And yet, looking at it from the reverse, how many people really equate Susan B. Anthony as an abolitionist? She was an abolitionist before she was a suffragette. Yeah, it is. It is. And so it kind of gets, yeah, uh, the, the, you, you would think here that perhaps, well, why not throw Harriet Tubman on the statue or, or, or something like that? Um, and, but then again, it depends. I get, maybe it depends on who's putting the statue up. Well, go back to what I mentioned earlier about the, you know, slavery being under the, being under the tutelage of the stars and stripes longer, a lot longer than under the stars and bars. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not condoning flying the Confederate battle flag, although the Confederate battle flag is not the stars and bars. Um, flying it, but at the, at the same time here, uh, let's understand reality, too. No, it's not. It's, it's con that's considered the southern battle flag. The stars and bars is actually a different flag. Yeah, there are a number of Confederate flags. A number. And a lot of them had, some of them had the the, what you consider the battle flag in miniature on one side and some other, some other ornament on the flag as well, right? The political flag. And so purists, purists say, well, the Confederate battle flag with the crossed, the crossed bars with the stars, that's not the stars and bars, that's the battle flag. That's like when you look at the Japanese rising sun flag, you had the white one with the red ball, but then the military flag had what? The red ball with the stripes coming out. You know, you can, you, you, you can split hairs here, but well, I think she came from Pennsylvania. She's a Quaker. Um, her father, her father was an ardent abolitionist, and her father eh, had uh, liberal notions that wasn't that weren't too well accepted by his by that by his Quaker. Um, congregation, so when they moved, at one point they moved to Massachusetts, and he actually became, um, he was an ardent abolitionist. His, his, uh, Susan B. Anthony's mother was not a Quaker, yet she raised her kids along those lines, though. Uh, but the whole family was, the, the, all the kids, her and her brothers and sisters were inculcated with uh, to be uh, to understand politics, the hard work ethic, uh, you know, uh, it's not slavery isn't right, you know, uh, uh, kind of um, uh, regard for society and for your fellow man. And so she became an ardent abolitionist, but she'll eventually go, she'll gravitate toward the suffragette movement, and everyone thinks that that's what she was, she was really about. It is. That's, that in the end is true, but she was an ardent abolitionist. She was an ardent abolitionist. Interesting. You know, when you, again, going back to what we were discussing earlier, Harriet Tubman was a suffragette? Yeah, she was. She was. And Susan B. Anthony was an abolitionist? Yeah, she was. She was. In fact, Susan B. Anthony, with the suffragette movement, uh, you know, they, her and, her and uh, uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton fell afoul of some of the abolitionists because when it came to, the, to, to 1870, the black man's right to vote, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and uh, Susan B. Anthony were against that amendment because it did not include women. She got arrested for trying to vote in 1874. In fact, her and four, almost 49 other ladies got arrested. She's the one that will be put on trial. And she will win that case. She won't vote, but
but she's she was supposed to pay a hundred dollar fine. She says, I'm not paying a fine. I'm not paying a, I'm just not paying that fine. Well, some of the journalists, when they were following this trial, guess who they favored? Susan B. Anthony. So she never paid the fine, she never served any jail time, but she couldn't vote either. She couldn't vote either. That was an interesting story too. But yes, uh, people like William Lloyd Garrison uh, were trying to tell Susan B. Anthony, look, let's get the black man to vote first, then we'll do the women. And Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth, uh, Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, we're still gonna be waiting 100 years. Somebody just said close. Yeah, and I remember my wife telling me, she go, you know, uh, 30 years ago, you know, we were talking about politics and she said, look who got to vote first, the black man, the white, the women, forget w black and white, women had to wait. She says, there's gonna be a black man president first before a woman. Well, I don't think there was, I honestly don't know if there was much in the way of fighting in California, that, that's a good question. I do know, uh, there was uh, Colorado, uh, there were some problems because uh, the, in states like, uh, I wouldn't, it's not Midwest, that's West, but uh, horses for cavalry, the, 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 the herds of wild horses, you want that. You want that, yeah, you want that. And so to get those horses for kids, keep in mind, cavalry is still very much in vogue here. In fact, when you go to the, I think it was the Battle of Brandy Station in 1863, it was the greatest cavalry battle of the war. 10,000 Union cavalrymen against 7,000 Confederate cavalrymen. Yeah, wow, that's almost like a huge tank battle. You need horses. Right. That I honestly don't know, but that's a good question too. I, you know, that, that's, that, that's, 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 that's a good homework assignment. How did California come in that size? And it's not like, all right, it's a fairly wide state. It's long. Right, right. Yeah, that's a long state. It's a long state, and it has one of the, it's got quite an economy, although that economy's been taking a hit lately you know, climate change and the fires and the drought and so on and so forth. Um, but it's still an important, it's still an important strategic entity here. So when someone says, well, I'm going to cut off the funding for the fire, for firing, fighting the fires, what are you, stupid? Jeez. Christmas. Yes. Yeah, there probably was, you know, but, uh, but then again, uh, you know, when they talk about, you know, when you read the chronicles of the war, when they're talking the Eastern Front, which is the Eastern Seaboard, and the Western Front in the, in, the, in the Civil War, they're really talking about that Mississippi River area is what they're doing. And that's significant, Mississippi River. That's significant. That's a big one. So it's important. Someone else had a question. Gary, did you have your question? Well, there was, there were still some in the, nor the northern business interests that didn't want to see the expansion of slavery uh, because they didn't want to compete with unpaid toilers. Now, you're industrializing here, so you got wage, wage earners here. Not that you're paying these people a whole lot of money, uh, especially when you got eight-year-old kids working 10 hours a day or whatever the case may be. You're not paying them a lot. Yeah, it sure is. It, you know, if you want to use that term, yeah. Uh, but at the same time here, uh, you know, I'm just, re I'm reading Bruce, I'm reading a book by Bruce Caton right now, America Goes to War, and I'm on that chapter, Why Did the Men Fight? And yeah, there was that aura of patriotism, uh, but for some, this was an adventure too, war was still an adventure for some people. But the, pro the, the thing here is though, um, yeah, there, there, there were Southerners who, who thought uh, there, some of these poor white farmers, they're not slave owners, but you're on our land and we want you off. And so again, will people fight to protect, if they think they're protecting their town, their farm? Yeah, they will. And I think, I think the Southern soldier epitomizes that. 
I mean, like, like a, and, but at the same time, he understands, the small farmer understands that he's not selling his grain or his pigs to Britain or France. He's selling his grain and his pigs and his, and his, and his horses, perhaps, to the plantation, who in turn exports his crops. And so the small farmer is beholden to the land of gentry. And so to protect my economic interests, I'm going to grab a gun. That's, that's part of this. It's not all of it. Uh, up north, there were many people who said, yeah, let's keep the country whole. And, of course, that didn't stop. That didn't stop uh, some of these northern soldiers from looting, burning, uh, you know, uh, their fellow Americans. Uh, you know, uh, Grant was more or less, these people seceded. Guess what? It's a different country, at least for now. And yet at, the, yet at the same time when it's over with, how did he treat Lee? Could keep his sword and his pistol. <laughs> really. There was still that respect. Interesting how that is. Interesting how that is. And some of the southern soldiers can keep their horses. They're going to need those horses if they're going to rebuild their farm. So. Well, they went to the same school. Right. right. In fact, many of these officers uh, were West Point. You know, some, there are mili there's a couple of military historians who said it was a West Pointers war. It's one way of looking at it. And, you know, getting into the military aspect of this, uh, you can see that uh, many of them uh, were taught under that Baron Henri de Germany type of warfare, the Napoleonic Germany type of war. And yet, that's going to change by 1864 when repeating arms, breech loaders, the Gatling gun comes out. Uh, yeah, for, forget the Napoleonic lines. We better start digging trenches here and we got to hide because there's more lead coming. And so this begins to change. And so now we're getting more into uh, if you want to use the term, uh, the Karl von Clausewitz term, uh, um, uh, outlook on warfare. And so uh, it's, it's changing. But many of these generals had been trained, you know, or, or as officers at West Point, many of these officers had been trained as uh, in that Napoleonic de Germany type of warfare, uh, the linear type of warfare. That's going to change here as this war goes on. And um, interestingly enough, Alfred Thayer Mann, who wrote the book, uh, the, the, the Influence of Sea Power Upon History in 1890, which was a game changer for naval, war, for, uh, naval strategy here, uh, his father taught uh, uh, the Napoleonic de Germany tactics at West Point. Interesting how that is. Yes. No, this this would this was established this was established strategy, and the idea here was let's let's take it to their economy, and that's exactly what Sherman's going to do. He's going to on a sixty mile wide path of destruction from one side of the Confederacy to the other. Uh, we're going to tear up the railroad tracks, burn the rolling stock. We're going to steal from the farms, and what we can't steal, we're going to burn. We're going to blow up the factories we find, uh, the saltpeter, burn it. Uh, this, this is economic warfare. Oh, yeah. This, this is all part of the strategy at this point, 1864-65. Right. You know, and so, again, uh, I, you know, I, subscribe to that, I subscribe to that notion that what uh, Grant and Sherman, if you want to throw Sheridan in here, do in 1864-65 from horseback, uh, the United States and Britain's going to do in B-17s, B-24s, Lancasters, and Halifaxes to Germany from 25,000 feet up. It's economic war. Let's bomb the factories, bomb the rolling stock, bomb the port and dock facilities. So on. And then, and then uh, Bomber Harris, while we're at it, let's burn German cities down. That's modern war. 
Well, you know, and, and the looting that went on. I mean, this is war. This is, this is, this is where you're going. This is modern industrialized war. Uh, the rudiments of same here. And, and Grant was going to take on the South's Beth's army. And that was Lee's army of Northern Virginia. And wear it out. And while he's wearing that out, what, what's Sherman doing? The economic aspect of this. Just and just go from one end of the Confederacy to the other. And it's, it's a scorched earth policy. That's exactly what he's doing. And, uh, and the South can't, can't cope with this. And they can't do it to the North. They don't have that capability. So it's one-sided at this point. You know who's going to win this war by 1864. In fact, the British and the French knew who was going to win this in 1862 because they began to invest in the North. They weren't stupid. So, yeah. And, uh, yeah, because once federal troops left, <coughs> and the, the, that leaves a, a, a void that some Southerners are going to fill. And uh, it was to rein in the blacks. And that's exactly what this is. And so blacks are still second-class citizens. Sure, they're own, they can own some land, and many will, but can they take part in the political system? Uh, and, and depending on where you are in the South, some places worse than others, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's open season on blacks, going back to lynching and this kind of thing. Right, which is why, and in, in our move, and our westerns don't show this, that a lot of black men went where? West. Cowboys, cavalry, and we don't, we don't show that too well in our western movies. And that's understandable, I guess. That maybe, that's not, that maybe that wasn't going to make a lot of money back in the 40s and the 50s. But the fact of the matter is, yeah, a number of... A number of black men, and why not? Why, be on a, why not be on a cattle drive instead of living in the South? Why not do that? And yet, I just gave a talk on, on, uh, on, on Martin Luther King this morning that, you know, uh, when, you know, going, going into Selma, Birmingham, the Montgomery bus strike, yet Martin Luther King said one of the most violent episodes, one of the most one of the most dangerous episodes in his career was in Chicago. <laughs> Chicago. Uh, he got hit in the head with a brick there. Somebody hit him in the head with a brick. And they, though, you know, many of those whites there did not want that housing for blacks. He said it, he said it was worse than Selma, Montgomery, or Birmingham. This is Chicago. But then again, it's Chicago. Why be surprised? And so, yeah, it... You know, for many, peop many white people, it could, be, it could be Boston, it could be Chicago. I don't want them here in our neighborhood. You know. uh, but of course, they were slaves here, but it wasn't like it was in the South. And so when we talk about slavery, what is the first thing that pops up? The South. So... But I mean, it, it's going to take a long time. Going back to what you were say, uh, saying, Gary, I mean, it's going to be Franklin D. Roosevelt who really begins the process of desegregating the armed forces, but it's Truman who signs off on the legislation. And the Air Force, right out of the, almost out of the starting gate. And then the Navy, the Marine Corps, but the Army, they drag their feet. In fact, I've seen interviews with black soldiers from the Korean War. And... There's some of these black soldiers who say, well, guess what? White units got better arms and equipment than we did. Yeah. And, and that's when, you know, uh, Martin Luther King, and he was warned not to do it, uh, began to equate Vietnam with the civil rights movement. And, um, and I think, I, you know, like a lot of people like the I, I Have a Dream speech, I think arguably maybe not one of his best, if not his best, was that speech he made on April 4, 1967 about the Vietnam War. He lost some fans, but because he made that case, why do young black men go to Vietnam to fight and then come home? How are they treated?
Oh, I, I think, I think, I think, and and I and I and I and I'm and I'm a firm believer in this, that I getting back to the idea of uh, uh, total war that you're seeing here. Um, uh, total war. Americans, for the most part, <clears throat> and you'd have to be hard pressed to find one, going back to maybe somebody who was in the Bataan Death March or somebody who was bombing Germany. But I mean, if you talk to a Russian, a Pole, a, a Brit who was lived through the Blitz, these are people who know total war. Americans, for the most part, are clueless. The only Americans to me who really knew total war because they were on the receiving end of it, were the Southerners of 1864-65. They lost, they're occupied, their government has fallen apart, uh, their economy is shattered, uh, their way of life has been cast into the dustbin of history, and their future is bleak. They're the only real, there are only real Americans who really understood total war because they were on the receiving end of it. And I don't think that's taught. I don't think that's really talked about. And I, you know, that, to me, that's a history lesson that's just waiting. And when I talk about this, I always bring this up because they're the only one, they're the only Americans who really understood total war. They ought to know. They were on the receiving end of it. Part of it is, I, th I think it's uh, American arrogance. Um, you know, we, we, like to, we like to talk about our veterans, and that's fine. Uh, but there's very few who know. Uh, talk to a Marine who was on Taro. I mean, talk, talk to a GI who was at the Battle of the Bulge. They can tell you a total war. Talk to a GI who got stuck in that hellhole known as the Pusan Perimeter. You know, talk to a talk to a talk to a Marine who was at Fallujah recently, or even talk to a Marine who was at Way in '68. Uh, yeah, th this is the closest you're going to get. Or talk to an airman who was on those bombing raids over Germany, or Japan for that matter. I Man, it's total war. That's total war. Examples of total war. But 1864-65 are the is the 19th century example of this, but it's Americans on the receiving end of it. Of course, there's Americans perpetrating this, but it's Americans on the receiving end of it. And I don't think that's really taught. Yeah, it is sad. I think it's a, I think it's a, a, le a lesson that's missed. Well, yeah, and in fact, I'm going to be giving a talk at the Wilton Library 4 o'clock this coming Sunday on Versailles. And boy, is that going to be job one, what you just stated about Germany. That's going to be job one. 4 o'clock on the Versailles Treaty. And so or as the Germans call it, the diktat. But yeah, uh, again, you go back to article, you know, you know, what you're alluding to here is article 231. Germany and associated powers are responsible for the war. Well, who are the associated powers? They're not named. Of course, they don't exist at this point. The Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Ottomans. But Germany does, but Germany, Germany's named. Germany and associated powers. And so my, my take here is if the, if the British and the French were really committed to democratic government, they would have helped the Germans instead of punishing them. I mean, okay, let them pay, I understand that, but if you're, gonna, if you're really practitioners of democratic or representative government, well, wouldn't you want to see it succeed in Germany so there's not another war? Which again, leads me to say, this war was fought for democracy? Yeah, okay. All right. You want to believe that school book story? Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, you can make that argument. The Japanese accomplished more with all those cars on car ships coming over here than aircraft carriers did in the Second World War. You know. Uh, yeah. You know, hey, it's... Uh, You know, it always is in the end. Um, eh, history does this. <clears throat> it's never exact, but it repeats. So, 
Anyway, you're welcome. No, thank you for coming. <laughs>